All right, starting the fifth call of the WARF project. We'll have to rename the YouTube channel since I think it's still calling these the Web Client SDK meetings. Um, it's been maybe three weeks, short break due to the holidays in these calls and just some timelines that didn't align to actually be able to present anything fun in these calls. So back now, hopefully back on a cadence of every other week or every week, depending on when things are available to make these happen. Um, I think we're going to be opening up the Telegram channel here in the relatively near future to other developers. Like we'll put out a call in the Antelope developers channel, get people into the Warp Telegram channel to start specifically engaging and talking about this. It seems like JavaScript SDKs has been discussed more than usual in those channels, which I really like because it's a topic I can engage on. So. Um, the last call right before the holidays uh, that was supposed to happen that did not. The one thing we wanted to dive into on this call was that we have now published the brand kit. Uh, we, I think, are going to be submitting to the coalition that the, the branding itself, like the core being, here's the brand, here's the messaging, here's everything you need to do to understand this brand and how to use it is available on the website. There's PDFs, there's zips. Uh, the website itself also has some quick references for the people who may just need a logo or want to know what the color schemes are or want to know the fonts, um, as well as some just quick assets. Um, the zip itself has a lot more. There's like a couple dozen assets in there. The PDF is a bunch of pages that talks about the messaging, the architecture of the brand. Uh, it also includes some imagery and some use cases. So. That'll be for those who want to dive in a little bit deeper. Um, I think on the coalition call coming up, we'll be seeking some feedback in that regard, potentially pushing, I think it was milestone eight or nine, uh, as into a completed state pending on feedback. You know, if people have issues, feedbacks, concerns with the uh, branding itself, we can address that. But um, it's publicly out there. It's on the uh, website, and I think our team's pretty happy with it. It may evolve slowly over time, but it's also something that we can kind of mark as complete and then address in the future if need be. So short, sweet update on the branding itself. Um, related to the website, we've been spending the last couple weeks uh, on weekly calls, which go I don't know, maybe hour and a half, two hours each week, where we're discussing the entire site map. This is going to be a rather large website uh, filled with, obviously, things like the brand, things like the updates we've been doing. The progress section has actually turned into a blog, which I'll get to uh, here in a little bit. But there will also be both a learning section on this site that we'll be able to lean into as well as uh, reference material for all of the documentation. Um, there's actually going to be three main product sections of this site that goes over the three main kits that are that make up WARF. Each one will have their own page. So there will be a session kit page, there will be a contract kit page, and there will be an account kit page. They all are for very different purposes. So we want to make sure that people know what those components of this overall SDK collection is. Um, and the other major section that's going to come like later this year, probably quarter three, maybe quarter two, is the kind of plugin section. It's think of it like a mini app store, or if you go to like the WordPress site and you can browse WordPress plugins, we really want to try to use the website to foster community creation of tools that other people are going to be able to use in their applications. Um, this is all very forward thinking based on how the development of this is going right now. But with how like this website's going to have, I don't know, 30, 40 pages or something like that, that are main pages with some of them will have subsections. Like obviously the learning section is going to have a lot as well. There's going to be a lot of guides and tutorials there that are how to use the pieces. Um, but the main pages, there's going to be quite a bit of them. We'll have to share the sitemap once it's in a, a more legible state. Uh, as we left it yesterday, it was kind of a tangled mess of spaghetti. There were like lines overlapping, and it was just kind of a mess. So 
<laughs> we need to untangle that in the, the Figma diagram before we start sharing it, because otherwise it's just going to look like a mess. Um, so yeah, the site has been a focus of part of our team for a while, while the other part's been working on the actual code itself. Um, diving back into that idea of converting the progress, which has just been housing these calls for now, turning into a blog. Uh, we have our first blog post written, um, which is kind of an introduction to the first kit, which is the one that is probably closest to ready for early adopters. Um, the blog post itself is going to introduce sessions and the session kit itself. Uh, we won't have to go over the whole thing. It's not live on the website as of this recording because we're still working on a few things. Like if we actually go to the blog, you can see there's HTML there. Um, so we're working out the technicals of deploying a blog on the site, but the actual content itself is ready. It's going to Are dive these going in. to somewhat serve as like documentation for this stuff. Uh, we think that we'll be able to generate some documentation based on this, but this post really is an introduction to the, like this technical preview of it. So we didn't want to call this documentation or a guide yet, because it's entirely possible that everything here changes in some way. So the we just want to get this. The purpose of this blog post is to get it out there and be like, hey, developers, give this a try. Maybe try building a plugin for it and help us get some feedback and let us know how this could potentially work for you in your you know, specific use case. We all use this technology stack so differently based on the applications we're building um, that you know, I like I our team doesn't know uh, we have very specific ways that we use it and we don't know how other people use it. So we really want to get hands-on experience. Hopefully, this blog post shows uh, the benefits of already starting to use it. That's kind of the goal of the whole thing. We dive into a little bit about the, like, what a session is and why that's familiar to Web2 developers and why we kind of went with this approach. Uh, we break down what the architecture of the session kit is and the three major components of it. Um, and then we dive into kind of a technical preview on how to use it as of today as of this really early version 0.1.1 that is live on NPM, can be used. You can install it in applications. Uh, go over how to instantiate a session manually. This whole guide is based on you writing a backend script in JavaScript, you know, like a service that runs in the background and performs actions on the chain, or you're writing a bot of some kind that does something. Um, so it's a very limited scope for the use. Um, but after we kind of show how to use it and what it does, we dive into transact plugins, which are one type of plugin for the session kit. Um, and we actually have the first plugin available, which I'll dive into a little bit later on this call. It's the resource provider plugin. And in this example, we ha pass it in to the session and it hooks into fuel and it works. So like you could write a backend service that runs today using this code that doesn't need CPU net on the account. It can ask for the transactions to be co-signed by Fuel, and Fuel will return a response, and then the session will automatically perform those transactions with the co-signed uh, action appended to it. So that's the part of this that we're hoping we can you know, put in front of people and be like, look, we're already solving one of these major problems with the architecture of this really early version of the session kit. It works. It may be buggy. It may change. Um, but that's why we want people involved already is to see this benefit and help us make it even better. So the post kind of ends off with uh, a little bit of discussion about the future and the current state of it. We want to make it really clear that this is a technical preview and things are subject to change. Um, and then it's going to end off with some links on where you can go to uh, get more involved. So hopefully we can spur some discussion from some of the regular developers in the community, um, maybe get them using it in some little you know, backend service, whether it's like a price oracle or whether it's, I don't know, something else. Like we have a block producer claim script that I might rewrite to use it. We really want to dog food this and use it in real applications 
So that way we can see what its strengths and weaknesses are really early on in development and make sure we address any of that. So this should be coming out as soon as we uh, uh, get the website capable of um, serving blog posts better. <laughs> so we thought about publishing it on Medium, but figured this was a good motivation to actually finish that part of the site and get it out. I'm hopeful that that may be by the end of the week. Um, and then we can start talking about this in developers chats and on GitHub and anywhere else that people want to talk about it. So, so yeah, the website is coming together nice. This blog post uh, will be out on it. Uh, any Anybody listening to this call that wants to engage, hopefully we'll be able to take something away from this and provide some feedback. Close hey, Aaron, that. Uh, yep. When you're doing the, the code out there and the code samples, is there a kind of working model of some kind of app or something like that? Or do you kind of just, is it just the snippets that are you putting out there? Uh, there are a lot of these snippets, um, like where we're actually using the session, creating a transaction, and including the plugin. Mm -hmm. um, those are all pulled from the unit tests the test. of, yeah. yeah, actually not that one, uh, of this one. Uh, all these repos are published under the WarfKit organization. They're public. Um, but if we dive into the tests of the plugin, uh, like you can see, this is where we're setting up the code. We're defining a transfer and we're creating a session action, calling the transact, and then we're making sure that like Gray Mass Fuel signed this transaction. Um, so it is in a functional way working in the unit tests. Sure. We haven't written like a little standalone app for it yet, though. Okay, that works great. So yeah, I that <laughs> that's kind of been a hallmark of a lot of our development is. All of the functional code is in unit tests until it's documented and pulled out. That's kind of step one. So, and there's some other features that we we didn't dive into in the blog post um, about this resource provider plugin, which is actually the next item on the um, the short list of topics I wanted to jump into on this call. Um, if we dive into the plugin itself, which I don't think is Oh, there's some documentation. We still need to touch that up a little bit. Um, is that we have these other options where the developer can, you know, you're writing a back end service potentially or a front end app, which doesn't work in the session kit yet. But in our examples, we're writing like the price feed oracle. I'll just use that as an example. Like if it's going to use something like fuel or a resource provider. We have these flags that allow you to modify the behavior of the resource provider, like allow fees. Do I want my co-signed transactions to have fees? And I think it defaults to false, but you could set it to true. And if it's set to true, then even if Fuel says, you know, no, we can't do this for you for free, but we can do it for you as for a fee, it will allow you in the plugin while you're building your application to say whether or not you want to allow fees. If you say you want to allow fees, there's also a max fee field where you can specify a token amount um, of like what the maximum acceptable fee would be for the type of transaction you're performing. Uh, if it is not set, I believe it'll set allow any fee, which could be dangerous. Um, Theoretically, the wallet would still show us though, right? Uh, in a front end facing user application, yes. It would, but I mean, if you're writing- As like long as a, the wallet's implemented. I mean, it's included inside of the transaction bundle of actions. Yes, it would okay. show it in the, on the wallet if a user was signing it. Um, and all these examples we're highlighting, they are backend services though, where no wallet is actually presenting the transaction. So we like if I were writing a price feed Oracle for gray mass to submit to like Wax or EOS or whatever, wherever we're publishing price feed data, I may say, yeah, let's allow fees, and I want 0 0.001 as the max fee or something. Um, and then the backend service that is doing the signing automatically without a wallet can you know, make the decision whether that fee is acceptable based on this flag. So we're trying to make it so that it works both for a user and for a backend service. So that's something we've never had before. 
I know there are backend services out there uh, that use Fuel. Like they just hit the API endpoint. They say, this is the transaction I want. And then they do all of this interpretation themselves in their application, um, including like figuring out if they want to accept a fee or rejecting it. Um, but this plugin has these options. So now instead of doing that in your application, you can just include the plugin and specify these kinds of fields. Um, so there's going to be more stuff probably added to this plugin to negotiate with the API, uh, as well as some additional validation. But yeah, in the user facing world, like they're going to see the token transfer while they're approving the transaction. And Anchor specifically, if we if we detect co-signing and then we detect uh, a transfer to us, we pop up like we specifically put it as a special line item that's like this transaction has a fee, and we like elevate that out of the transaction data for the user to notice. So. Yeah, this was the first plugin. We wrote it over uh, kind of the holiday break. Uh, it is one of the things that we said we were going to deliver as part of, I think it was milestone five or six. Um, but we needed to kind of dive into this to make sure that the architecture of the kits in milestone two is close to what we need it to be. Um, this also led to the creation of this repository, which is a transact plugin template. It is using GitHub's templates, so you can create a new repository using this. Um, and it is a, like if we go into the source code, that's the code. It shows how to create a class that extends the abstract transact plugin. It shows uh, how to register the plugin within Worf session kit. Uh, and then it goes in and it adds one hook to the before sign process. And all it does is console logs. So this is a repository that developers can take and say, I want to build a plugin that does x, y, and z. And it will have all of the scaffolding around it, including unit tests, uh, build processes, uh, the base packages that are going to be required, basically everything that we think is needed to be able to build one of these plugins. This template is what we're also going to use to create the next plugin. And hopefully, we'll be um, kind of evolving this over time to make sure it is a good starting point for somebody who wants to build a transact plugin either for their application or for the community. Because really, these plugins kind of have um, endless possibilities of what they could do during the transaction call. So hopefully for the um mm -hmm. for the session kit, does that also include signing? Uh yes. So like it is part of a plugin. I'm not sure I understand. Well, I'm I'm asking if core things like signing are part of a plugin system or are they baked into like uh a wrapper of Worf? that implements uh, the plugins. Signing itself is baked into Worf. It kind of happens in isolation right now. Um, it's done through a wallet plugin. Uh, I can jump quickly to the session kit. Uh, the session does is where the transact call lives. Um, we resolve the transaction here, and then we sign the transaction here and we kind of append signatures uh the wallet plugins themselves the only like for all of our testing right now we have one very simple plugin why is that not it's like a local local wallet yes uh what do we call it the private key wallet and what this does is it accepts a private key it stores the private key and then it signs transactions with that private key. So there's like no back and forth. It's like uh, in EOSJS world, it would be the uh, the signature provider, whichever one they they mm -hmm. recommend you yeah. don't use. <laughs> right. It's kind of the equivalent of that. So and that's how all of our tests work right now is we just we use this wallet plugin private key for nearly everything right now. But 
that is interchangeable. So that way you could drop in an anchor plugin or a scatter or whatever plugin you want. What, uh, what's actually under this? It's EOSJS or EOSIO? Like what is signing? What is this private key sign digest? Uh, this is EOSIO core. I see. OK. So this is uh, the private key object, this thing. That is a EOSIO core. You can see it up here. It's a okay. private key from e Graymass EOSIO, uh, which we're going to be moving soon uh, to the WorfKit repo, we think. Um, and there is a sign digest method on the private key where if you pass a digest, it returns a signature. Got it. So, and then here is where we're taking the transaction and we're creating this is also an EOSIO core object, this transaction. Uh, we're forming it into an EOSIO core object, and then we're creating the digest from the transaction because the transaction object has a signing digest method. Uh, we're passing in the chain ID, and then it gives you the digest of the transaction, and then it uses the private key object to sign that digest. So basically, the rest of these wallet plugins would just be some kind of asynchronous um, tunnel to the wallet itself. Yep, exactly. So, and then there are, we don't actually have it in here yet, but there is this, if I go back to uh, the session itself, this is one of the things we're starting on, we're starting to really talk about deeply right now. Um, there's this transaction context object within the session. Each time you perform a transaction, this context gets created. And this context will, right now it allows, like it gives you the data and the tools you need in a plugin to like understand the transaction that's happening. But this will also be passed to the wallet. And then in the wallet plugin, you will be able to use this information. And the next phase of the context is to start adding UI interactions. So this context will be passed to a wallet plugin and then the wallet plugin will be able to use this context to do things like prompt the user for an action or a piece of information or um, like it's it provides in the, the wallet. Inter uh, no, in the browser. So like on Anchor, I'm, I'm, we need to pop up a QR code, right? Uh, mm -hmm. It's either a link or a QR code. So. Worf is going to be the thing that actually shows you the UI in the browser in the the app, you know, that's using WarfKit. Um, right. So the anchor. Wallet oh, you mean plugin, in in the plugin? I yeah. see. Okay, not in the wallet itself. Correct. Got it. So and then you know it'll do whatever UI prompting it needs to do in the web app, and then it'll do that tunneling you were talking about, where it'll for anything that's using kind of the scatter WebSocket approach, it'll open that WebSocket relay the transaction, call the API calls it needs to, and then ultimately return uh, a signature. I think that's pretty much what comes back from these, where's it at? Yeah, the wallet just returns a signature right now. And then that would work for anything, whether it's injected from as a, an extension or it's some cross-site WebSocket or whatever yep. it might be. Yep. Got it. So. Anchor will be doing the same thing. It'll be opening a connection to one of our buoy servers and then relaying it, getting the response and kind of shuffling it back into the web app to be uh, fully assembled and then broadcast, whether or not it's broadcast. And so following up on that, is, is the eventual goal, Aaron, to Will the wallet plugin look more like kind of you have the resource provider plugins or the transact plugins? Is the eventual goal to have a wallet type plugin template or something like that, or is it always going to be buried under the session there? And that's kind of was confusing to me as well. Like, will will you be separating it out in future iterations? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, there will be like we have this. I think I changed it, but we have that transact plugin template. We'll have a wallet plugin template as well. Oh, okay. Um, that wallet, we're going to actually create, I think, three of them. We're going to do one for ESR. We're going to do one for you know the protocol behind Scatter because there's still a lot of wallets that use it. And then we're going to do one for the Wax Cloud wallet. Mm -hmm. um, and all of those plugins will be distributed. They'll be based on kind of a shared template, sort of like that transact template. Um, and they'll be published as individual 
packages that developers can then include in their applications and other developers will be able to kind of model any other wallet off of uh, this same approach. And they'll all have equal control over kind of how the UI can present the information and what's required of it. Uh, there'll be some branding opportunities for that. And yeah, it should kind of provide the groundwork for any analog based developer in the community that's building a wallet to build their own signing adapter, basically. Makes sense. Thanks. Yep. So yeah, um, those were kind of the last two things I had on my list was just the session is available. We have this blog post that kind of shows how to use it. It highlights the resource provider plugin that is now public. Or public. I don't think it's on NPM yet. We need to still do that, but it's usable. Um, and then there is a plugin to actually create these types of plugins themselves. So we have some other ideas of plugins that we want to do. We just haven't done them yet. One of them was a plugin that uh, uses the post broadcast hook, which is one of the four transact hooks that we have. And it takes the transaction that was just broadcast and then broadcasts it to a couple other API nodes to ensure that you know one or more APIs accepts this transaction was submitted. That's been kind of a, a widely requested feature for things like EOSJS and EOS IO Core for a long time because we have situations where APIs will say, yeah, we accepted the transaction, and then it gets lost in the peer-to-peer -peer network um, for whatever reason. There's been a lot of work on the Nodeo side of things that has improved that situation, but it would still be nice to allow that flexibility on the front end uh, to you know, say, I want to broadcast this to three API nodes instead of just one. So um, there's also like we could build a plugin that could do things like buy RAM. Like if you in the pre-transaction hook, you call the compute transaction call. And if the compute transaction call says, you know, it throws an error and says you don't have enough RAM for this transaction, then that plugin could actually just append a buy RAM action to the transaction. You know, and the plugin itself could use that transaction context object we were talking about to prompt the user with a yes or no that says, hey, this transaction is going to fail unless you buy RAM. Would you like to buy X RAM for X token? Yes or no? User clicks yes. It'll just change the transaction, then sign it, then broadcast it. Transaction works. If they click no, it's going to fail. Um, there's a lot of that kind of possibility here that we're excited to see how people take advantage of it. Like it really gives you the opportunity to solve some of the user experience problems that uh, so many of these applications face, you know, that it sucks when you are trying to do something and you get a RAM error and then you got to stop whatever you're doing, go to some other application, figure out how much RAM you needed and how like buy it and then go back and do whatever it was you were trying to do in the first place. Um, the UI stuff is, sorry, go for it. So the optimal flow, well, one possible optimal flow there would be that there's just like a, well, they could use that new API to run the transaction to see how much RAM is required and then just automatically add that to the transaction yep. uh, list. That's, hmm. that's actually what Fuel does on the backend service right now. For RAM? Yes. Oh, interesting. Yeah. If you submit a transaction to Fuel and Fuel like we sampled the transaction that was kind of the original intent uh we had a modified version of nodios that could accept transactions that didn't have signatures and then it would just they'd never go anywhere but we would get the cpu and net estimates back for that transaction and we found out that oh look we're also now getting errors from the api about ram so what we did is we handle those errors now and then we append a buy ram action into the transaction so that way it you know, it makes transactions that would have failed succeed now. And this, like we're doing that in the, like a centralized fashion through fuel, through the resource provider model. Um, but with the plugin architecture of Wharf, you could do that without a backend service. So it kind of, it breaks that dependency on a resource provider. 
Very cool. One of our next, like everything we've been, everything here, none of it has a user interface. So none of it is really usable in a web application at this point. It's all usable in backend services. Um, but right now our focus is starting to shift towards the user interface. We're starting to look at the technologies that we may want to use for the user interface uh, to make it modular enough and reusable enough. Um, that should be coming. Well, from in a developer's perspective, the, they could actually start building with this using the local private key, right? Yeah. Yeah, and experimenting with it. It's just the the connection to a user's wallet is not there yet. Right. That is the it doesn't have like the UL, UAL pop-up login with anchor or any of that kind of stuff, right? Yep. Basically any place you'd be using EOSJS, uh, the session kit is kind of ready to be used in. Any place you'd be using UAL, it it's not ready yet. Okay. So that is where we're starting to. By focus ready, on. do you mean functionality locked? Like if okay, here's what I'm asking. Because <laughs> I I know you caught the. I hope that you caught. Oh yeah, you did catch the um, question in the Antelope developers chat recently about front end guides and all that stuff. That I was prompted to ask that because people are asking me mm -hmm. about guides for it, right? Uh, and in the absence of it, it would be nice to not have to create a guide now, which uses either um esio core or esjs uh, and just go straight for this so that we don't have to redo those guides in n months right so do you think that it's locked down enough it's solid enough the code base rather is solidified enough that we could start creating at least something with the private key stuff the local private key uh potentially so long as you don't mind potentially updating what some of the data structures look like at some point um, and a lot of that's going to be based on feedback. I think it was on our last call, there was feedback about if we could remove the chain ID as a requirement when creating a session. Um, the permission, right. the, there's a field when you're creating a session called permission level, and maybe that's not clear enough. Maybe we need to call that account permission or account or something like that. Um, so in terms of like the structure, we think it's good pending feedback from you know, developers that start using it. Um, but some of the fields and the variables and the return types might be changing a little bit. Um, and that that's largely oh, wait, based on, yeah. We'll, and we want people to start using it so we can collect that feedback and lock it down. Like we just don't want to lock it down without any feedback. Yeah. Well, so, OK, we have, we're going in two directions internally. We're going in, in text and video. So maybe I'll wait for the video stuff because it's a lot harder to change that stuff yeah. in, in video. Um, but it's possible that we'll create some preliminary how-to guides for this in text uh, so that at least we can get people using it so that we can source that feedback. Yeah. Yeah, and frame it in a way that like there's like it works and this is an opportunity to help, uh, you know, shape how this is going to be done in the future, right? Um, because, like, that's a big part of this project. Is you know, we we've had one tool that largely hasn't changed since before the network launched, before EOS launched, before any of these chains launched, um, and it's always kind of been this one way, and it's never really changed. And we have this opportunity now to create something newer and better based on all of our collective experiences. And we definitely want that kind of wisdom of the crowd to impact what the final shape of this is, or like a version one shape is. Um, hopefully in the coming months, there will be a version one, and that's when we'll absolutely lock down uh, what the kind of structure and protocol is, and then we can do breaking changes in version two or whatever. Um, but until we get to version one, I would say it's subject to change based on feedback. Cool. Well, we are uh, we're pretty happy with the way things are heading, but. I'm I'm fully anticipating somebody's going to be like ah this this doesn't work for our use case so we'll have to uh, see where that goes and I would say expect more plugins in the coming weeks 
Um, we hope that we can get other people to start writing plugins for whatever use cases there are so we can really test that capability. Um, the account kit is probably going to be something we talk about soon. Uh, the trajectory of you that. Mentioned the, hmm? uh, you mentioned the scatter plugin that people, some wallets are still using the scatter protocol. Mm -hmm. They're using the injection side of that, right? Nobody, I doubt anybody's using the WebSocket. I believe that's true. OK, that makes things simpler. Yeah. It shouldn't be too bad. I, I'll, I'll admit, I am not well versed on that. Um, Neither am I at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I used the scatter kind of approaches like maybe a couple years ago, but I haven't touched it since. Um, so I'm going to have to get a good refresher on that. Or whoever on our team works on that is going to have to like really dive in and start using the token pockets and the wombats and the, all the other wallets that still yeah. support that uh, and just make sure that those work really well here. So I'm almost certain that none of them use the WebSocket approach. I think Scatter Desktop was really the only one who did. Uh, so at least it should be limited to injection. Cool. Cool. Yeah, that shouldn't be too terrible then. Um, and then Wax Cloud Wallet takes a completely different approach with you know opening browser windows with URL right. parameters and and then it it's not in the scope of the project, but then there's also direct ledger integration and like what a ledger plugin would look like. So that way you could just use your ledger connected to uh, whatever browser supports that without any sort of wallet. Not that I I mean there's a whole can of worms there about whether that's a good idea or not, because you can't yeah. verify the transaction you're signing. So there's security holes there. Um, but yeah, it's something that people want. If you uh, refresh my memory on the ledger, I haven't used one in a while. Mm -hmm. If you have a transaction that has a transfer plus arbitrary, not arbitrary data, but an arbitrary uh, action in it, will it show you both of the actions? You have to approve each of them, or does it just show you the arbitrary data hash thing? It shows you each individual action. And so long as it is an EOSIO contract or EOSIO.token contract, it'll render out all the data for okay. human consumption. It's just as soon as you get outside of those two contracts, you're just right. signing arbitrary data that you have no idea what it and is. the only one of that might that might be dangerous might be like an NFT or something. Yeah. Something with monetary value, basically. Yep. Got it. Yeah. Or it's I like I'm I am the worst person to talk about smart contract development, but if there was a way that a smart contract could uh, affect the EOSIO token, but you're performing an action on a different contract, like that could be dangerous. Um, obviously, there'd be some weird permission setups for that to even be able to happen. But there's, I know that there are just concerns around um, not being able to understand what you sign. like. Maybe USDT is a good example of that, like the Tether Tether contract. Like, if you're transferring Tether on EOS, you and using a ledger, you have no right. idea yeah. unless something is interpreting it for you. That's true. So, a lot of people like it because they don't need an app. It's just got that huge risk in it. There's a lot of trust. You need to trust the web application you're using and trust that it's not compromised. And yeah, preaching to the choir here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's an interesting problem because it does show the hash. I've had really bad time trying to replicate uh, the checksum that it shows in a in a web UI, but it's possible. But there's nothing yeah. that really. There's no way to verify in that same app that you're using whether the checksum they show you matches the yeah. parameters they showed you. You yeah. have to go to another app or something. Yep. They could just the web app could just show you the hash of the malicious transaction exactly. and that would match the device. And then you'd be like, okay, that's what I asked for. And in reality, it took all your money. Exactly. Oh, let's let's not talk about this on a recorded video and give people <laughs> ideas. <laughs> well, it's just it's a good reason not to use your ledger directly with a web browser. So yeah. you got to use it with another trusted app. Just Anchor maybe, hint, hint. yeah, maybe someday that the these types of devices will be powerful enough to you know accept an ABI and then actually render out the full transactions for everything, and it won't need to be hard coded. 
but as it stands right now, they are not. Um, maybe their new e-ink ledger will have a lot more processing capability and be able to handle this. I don't know. Perhaps. Who knows what the future will hold? But so yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Um, that's all I had on the list of topics to kind of talk about. Uh, there's some administrative stuff to be doing, um, which I'm sure will be part of the coalition call coming up. So do you guys have any questions, comments, other topics you want to talk about? Fantastic update. Glad Thanks. To Glad to see it's going at the speed it's going. Yeah. Totally agree. Awesome. Well, we will uh, wrap up this call here. Uh, and as it inches closer to next week, we'll figure out if there's another one of these next week. So happy New Year's, everybody. And uh, looking forward to keep doing these and keep showing uh, what this is capable of doing. That's kind of the most exciting part of all of this. Sounds great. Wharf Kit 2023 for life. Right. All righty. I guess I'll catch you guys later then. Sounds great. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everybody.